We are recording today. <laughs> Not my tongue suit. Good morning, everybody. Or good afternoon, I guess now. Um, so, it's really nice to see everybody. Um, I think I've now gotten to see almost everybody face to face, which is nice. I know it makes a big difference to be able to sit down in class. So, um, do remember that wherever you're seating um, is your space for the rest of the semester. So, um, those of you um, that are online, when you come back on Friday, make sure that you're sitting in the same seats. Um, and those of you that I have in front of me today, make sure when you come back um, next Wednesday, and of course you will have next Friday's class as well, um, that you're sitting in the same seat that you are in right now. Okay, I'm already sharing my screen. Okay. So, today we are going to go ahead and get rocking and rolling right into regular class. So, um, remember that most of the slides that I share, you have <coughs> some version of them on our eLearn portal. These will be found right now under our uh, lecture, which is um, the master class, or it looks, uh, this semester it looks like a puffer fish. Um, under week one, right, and I think it's like themes or something is what I have the file named as. Um, and so they're shown as red PDF files um, if you want to follow along with those. Um, okay, um, and everything looks shiny on line Fallon? Great. Uh, before we get started with actual content, there's one more thing that I want to talk about, and that is your email or message communiques um, with me or probably any of your instructor or TA types. Uh, and this is mostly for your sanity more than it is for anything else. Um, and that is the more specific that you can be in a message, the better. So whether you're calling, uh, messaging at this point or sending an email, the more information that you give in your message, the easier and quicker that you will get the help that you are looking for, or the defrustrationing, if you will. Um, so, um, giving me your name and what class and section you are in is really important, particularly at the beginning of the semester. I will eventually learn who you are, um, but right now, I have 120 new students. And though I will probably recognize your name, which is not problematic, it will be significantly much more difficult for me to place what class that I know you from. Right? So whether I have you in Bio 130, or I have you in Ecology, or I have you in... Um, so telling me what class you are looking for help for, particularly to, I need help in lecture, I need help in lab, um, will get you whatever you need much quicker. <coughs> now, I'm a little lucky where I have four sections of you guys um, and in multiple groups, but I do just have the one master section, right? You guys are all on one big e-learn page. So if you're asking for a grade, it's not really a scavenger hunt for me to find you, and I'm only teaching one of the four lab sections. Dr. Jimenez who is the other lab instructor, who also goes by Dr. J, if you've had the pleasure of meeting her already, teaches the other three. So if you are looking for help from her, it is incredibly important that you're giving her this information. Because if you just say, hi, Dr. J, I'm in your lab, can you look at my block quiz? She may have to clip, click up to six times per class to see if you're even in that particular section in order to find you. So it does become quite a large scavenger hunt. Um, so it's very helpful to you if you want stuff done quickly to give her just where you are. Okay? This becomes more important if you're emailing us like after five um, because if we do respond most of the time it's from our phones and if you haven't noticed eLearn is not super mobile friendly for whatever reason. And it's not that I for example will not Go check your grade on eLearn, because I definitely will. 
Um, but it becomes extraordinarily difficult to bring different things up on eLearn, and it then becomes really hard if I have to look six or seven places. So it's very helpful to me if you just tell me exactly where you want me to look. So I can go in and look and reset something or figure out what has happened to you without making eLearn scream into the distance with sirens and all those things that these programs seem to do when they're not doing what we want them to. The other thing I want to say is when you have a specific question about your homework, that the more specific you can be, the quicker that you will get an answer. Okay. So, um, for example, if you say, <coughs> I need help on homework too, you're probably just going to get a message or a chat box back or an email back that says, okay, okay, but what is it about homework too that you're feeling frustrated about, right? So we're going to have to work back and forth probably several times to figure out what it is that you're feeling frustrated with. If you can say, I'm feeling frustrated about question five on homework two, that's better, okay, we're being more targeted. And I wrote all of the homeworks, and I have access to all of them, but again, if I'm not sitting right in front of my computer at that second, and in this case, if I'm not sitting right in front of homework two, it's extraordinarily unlikely that I'll remember exactly what question five was about. So I'm either going to send you an email back and say, can you remind me what exactly the question was? Or if I've got time, I may yank up my PDF version of the homework and look at it. But either way, it's going to take a little, little bit of pigeon digging for me. If you instead say, on homework two, question five, it's talking about right, ATT and glycolysis, right? or if you say, I'm feeling very frustrated with the pathway of metabolism, and I don't feel confident can we talk about this, that is something I can very easily respond to, right? It may be a quick answer, or it may be, let's bring up the chat box and figure out what it is that you're not feeling great about, right? But it's something that without having to dig or send you 15 emails back, you can get a very fast answer and I can say, this is what we can do about this right now, right? So you can get the fastest, most valuable information back. <clears throat> the same goes when you're emailing your TAs, okay? So give them your name and whatever section you're in. Okay, and letting them know that you're a student in this class, right? Because our TAs, both TA and tutor, so they're getting messages from lots of students, okay? As well as they're in classes of their own. So they've got students that they're doing group work with that they've just met. And so it's very helpful, again, if you're giving them information as they're meeting 80 new students as well. <coughs> and for the same reason, be specific. Right, because they didn't, in fact, write all of the homeworks, very surprising, or the exams. They do have access to them, but it's a lot harder for them to get at them because they have to go through them through, like, our secret folders, get at the original versions, right? They don't have the same access that I do. So it's a lot easier for the TAs if you just ask the, the core question in order to get help, okay? They are still very able to do all of those things, but the easier you make it on them, the faster and more uh, information that you'll be able to get out of them. Um, lastly, one of the things I want to be um, pointing out is one, neither of our TAs, uh, Fallon or and Jasmine, remember, and that's why I used it for Nancy, remembered it, is the 9 a.m. TA, Fallon, who's sitting up front here, is your TA for this class. Um, neither of them can see the lab material. Right? They only have access to the lecture materials. Okay? Now, that doesn't mean they don't understand many of the concepts. So if you have a very general question about, say, glycolysis, they may be able to help you, but they are not going to be able to help you with any of the assignments, right? Because they haven't <laughs> seen the lab practical, so they don't know what's on it or any of that business since they themselves are in bio one three. And the test has changed pretty significantly in the last four years. <laughs> so it's been quite a long time. And they can't go look at it, right? Because they're not in that e-learn page. 
So if you have questions about lab, um, your lab instructors are the best first place to go. If you feel like you need tutoring in lab, the tutors are able to get some of that information or they can request it through us to help you. Okay, so that's another place you can get that. Okay, the last thing I would mention is with all times, and particularly with the TAs, I think when most students email a professor, they know you're probably not going to get a response back in 10 seconds. But sometimes with TAs, students email a TA and they get frustrated if they don't get a response back in 10 seconds. Um, that they're also um, have, you know, 15 to 21 credits of coursework. So keep in mind that they are very fast, um, but give them give them a little bit of time. And if they're not up at midnight, don't be frustrated with them at that either. <clears throat> okay. Any questions about any of that business? Shiny. Go for for all of this stuff too. That they're all all of those announcement pages and stuff on eLearn. If you feel like you really do need something at midnight, that those are really good resources for that as well. Okay. Um, on all of the lectures that I give you, um, they all start for the most part, and then are interspersed with what I call roadbacks, which uh, serve the goal of telling you what are we going to do for this particular unit. And then where are we in the unit as far as achieving those outcomes or, of the, those, or those goals? Gracious. So, really used to interacting with the screen. So you can see me kind of correct myself a whole bunch today. So for this particular roadmap, you can see we have two major subsets of goals, right? The first of which is really an overview of what the class is about. Okay, so what exactly is biology and what are the major, what I like to call houses of study that we're going to look at. Okay. The second one is really what is science and how do we do science. which also works well for calling it practicing biology because these are the same core ideas that are going to feed really nicely and what you're going to do in, uh, in lab next week. Okay. So a lot of this is going to have to do with what you need to do to do a proper scientific experiment, what kind of key skills will build into that. Right, so those are our two goals. We obviously are not going to get through all of them in one day. That's the goal of the unit, right? So good? Okay. So let's start at the top. All right, so let's, for once, use some fun tech. Stuff that doesn't make me cry myself to sleep at night. Okay. So what I want you to do is on the device that you're choosing, go to menti.com. Okay. Or if you're feeling very feisty, you can download the app. It's your level of commitment, my man. Okay. But the website works just fine, just like soccer did. Okay. When you get there, it's going to ask you for a code. Okay, in this case, our code is four digits, 63, 61, 15, and 3. You can see it in the upper right-hand corner behind that obnoxious string thing. I don't know if we use it. For you, those of you online, it's in the purple box. Okay, so I want you to give me one feature of what makes an organism alive. So how do we differentiate living organisms from non-living organisms. I wonder if people 
because it has friends and online. I thought I thought I split it in half for the net. Okay, give it a hot second before I interact with it, because when I start circling on here and things move around, it starts looking like a hot mess express. Okay, looks pretty settled. Okay, so let's, let's start looking at these biggest to smallest, right? And so this is a word bank. The biggest words are the ones you guys answered most frequently. Of course, if you guys type them in a little differently, that doesn't mean some of these things aren't on here more than once. So I'm going to do my best to sort of involve these. So two of the most biggest and striking ones, we have cells. Okay, This is a great one, right? And you'll see, and I'll show you the finalized list when we're done, but I want to talk about what we came up with here. All right, so cells is absolutely dead on, right? And this is one of the most important things. And in fact, truly, right, what we mean is you have to be made of one or more cell, right? Because you can have single-celled living organisms. We can think of some bacteria, right? Or some single-celled swimming organisms, right, that live in ponds. Think something like a minute, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> I can't say that word today. An amoeba, right? Or some other prokaryotes, right, live in their best life. Okay, so all those things are single-celled, and they're alive, okay? And of course, most of the time, with our mammal bias, right, we tend to think of multicellular organisms like us, a cat, okay? Reproduction, also super important, okay? I like to refer to this as biological immortality, okay? The point at which your cells or a cell is passing forward its genetic components to the next generation. Okay, so you're passing bits of yourself forward into the future, immortality, right? Okay, so both of these pieces are key pieces. Oh, I didn't move my circles. Okay, and so DNA is also correct, and this is tied into cells and reproduction. We'll talk about that. DNA is actually one of the pieces you need to be a cell. All right, so let's look at some of these other ones that all appear to be nearly exactly the same size. Um, let me kind of clump them together here. Glycolysis, photosynthesis go together, and anything under that pool if I'm missing them. So anything that ultimately has to do with, ooh, that was exciting, wasn't it? Energy, right? Okay, and energy is a fine, which is what you guys are sort of teasing around here, is a big pool, okay? So the ability to both take, in energy, okay, and that's really what we mean 
with photosynthesis is the very plant-centric version. Okay. So I'm taking in an energy, in this case sunlight. If I was doing the animal version, maybe I'm a lion, I'm consuming a zebra. Okay. I'm me, I ordered a cheeseburger. And okay. whatever it is though, I need to take in energy. Okay. Okay. And then if we think about glycolysis, okay, we're going to convert that energy. What we'll talk about is metabolism, right? But we're going to use that energy to do work in the body. Okay. What ultimately does can be very varied, okay? But something. Okay, all of the cells or bodies or tissues needs, depending on what scale it is. Okay, also see develop. Okay, this could be interpreted a couple different ways. All of them correct. Okay, I'm choosing to interpret this as growth. Okay, which is sort of the third step of the energy option. Okay, you would take that energy, you can convert it to doing things, walking, breathing, whatever. Okay, you can also use it to grow your cells, grow your tissues. Okay. Okay, we've got a few missing here. But we got a lot of the big ones, and I noticed very proudly that there's one on here that there shouldn't be that's a very classic pit bull. Heartbeat. Okay, I usually see heartbeat on here, but you guys haven't put on here, which is good. Why is heartbeat a bad choice when you're deciding whether something is a living organism or not? Ooh, you gotta yell for me, son. No, like what? What would be a good example of a living organism that doesn't have a heart? Bacteria. Bacteria don't have hearts, right? Good. Not even a common example, but dead on. Plants don't have hearts, right? Those also don't, right? So we tend to pick this, and most people do. You guys did a great job. And again, our mammal bias usually makes us think of things like people, cats. Giraffes! Those are all alive. They have hearts, so it's a part of being alive. But, hey, okay, all the other things we just talked about don't have hearts. But uh, they are very much alive. Okay, great job, guys. All right, so let's look at our complete list and talk about a handful of things hey, hey, that might be missing. I'm gonna. There we go. Ugh. Okay, so you can see on here you got like 90% of these, All right? So there's our having one or more cell. Okay, here is our very complicated all the things having to do to energy business. Okay, I need to take it in. I need to convert it. And remember this fourth one here, grow. That's how I was sort of interpreting your develop option, but I'm taking that energy in and using it, right, to increase my own tissue mass or cellular mass as appropriate. Okay, and here's our reproduction, right, passing on of that genetic <coughs> component. Right, from one generation to the next, right, to your offspring. There's lots of ways that can happen. It can be asexual or sexual, it doesn't matter. Okay, the key is that that genetic information is being passed on to the next generation. Mm. Okay, so all I was missing here were five and six. 
Okay, so five, the ability to adapt, uh, respond to stimuli. Okay, so we can interpret this several ways. Okay, so we can think of it as like I smell food, I move towards food. Okay, the lion stalking that zebra. I sniff cheeseburger, I go to cheeseburger. I'm hungry, I don't have to go. Okay, this could also be aversion, right? I burn or feel heat towards my hand, I pull my hand away. Okay. Plants, right, bend towards and grow towards light, okay? So all of that is response to stimuli. Sometimes it's quick, sometimes it's slow relative to your biological scale, but there is some kind of response system. <clears throat> okay, and then adaptation. And we'll talk about this a little bit more here in a bit. <clears throat> in detail, as we look at our themes, Okay, but the ability to respond to your environment. Okay, so we can think about things like camouflage. Okay, some things that make you better fit. Okay, so in a bit here we're going to talk about our steampunk moths. And they'll be a really good example of adaptation. <clears throat> Okay, anything on this list that doesn't make sense before we move on? Is still pretty good? All right. Clear off the crazy. Okay. Before we talk about our themes, one of the last things I want to talk about is the levels at which we can talk about biology. Okay? And so this class is ultimately designed to go bottom up. We're really going to build up an organism. Okay? We're not going to get all the way up to the biosphere by any sense of the means. Okay? But we're really going to work at building up an organism underground to understand how things are made, and how these things are interrelated. Um, and so what we really want to look at is what kinds of questions can we ask ourselves as we're looking at these things, um, and what do we mean when we talk about them? And that's really important, right? So when we're talking about things like atoms and molecules, this is going to be one of the first units we talk about. Right? These are really the building blocks of organelles and cells and cell food. Right? So we're really going to talk about carbohydrates and proteins. Right? We both know that this is what makes up your food, but this is also what makes up the working mechanisms of the inside of your cells. <coughs> and you can already kind of think in your head, well, if I eat more or less protein, or if I have a disease that breaks down protein, right? how does this affect how my cells work? Okay. Then we look at something like organelles. Okay, so organelles literally meaning many organs, okay, which are functioning within the cell. Okay, and that's how it works. These are many organs that are doing jobs within the cell. Okay, so the first one we can think of is like a mitochondria. A powerhouse of a cell, right? <coughs> So we can look at what are the jobs of each of these and what happens if they overdo or underdo their jobs. Okay. We'll spend a lot of time looking at cells themselves. Remember, this is at its core, okay, the first level of life. Okay, we have single-celled living organisms. Okay, cells can bind together, work in cahoots, make multicellular organisms. Right? Create tissues and organs, your skin, your liver. Okay, we can start asking questions about what happens when they break down. Okay, so we'll talk a little bit about things like cancer. How did that happen? That's always a favorite unit. 
up till we get to talking about things like whole organisms. Okay. So, of course, a whole organism is a single organism. Okay. Just me. Okay. Just your pet betta fish Sally. That's exactly what I would name a betta fish. Sounds fierce. Okay. A single organism differs from a population, and this is a really easy mistake to make. These are the levels I find students mix up the most. Okay, a population is a group of a single type of organism. Okay, so if a single organism is one gray squirrel that attacked you for your french fries outside the student union, a population is all of the gray squirrels on campus that you are convinced formed a mafia to attack students for French fries. Okay, but it's a population, right? It's all of the local gray squirrels. So it's all of one thing, gray squirrels, in an area on campus. Okay. So what happens if we're interested in more than just gray squirrels? Okay. Their reach goes far beyond themselves. Then we want to look at communities. Okay, a community is all living things in a given area. So if we still are focused on campus, this is going to be the angry gray squirrels. Okay, all of the people. Okay. The different types of trees and grasses, I am not super great at plants, so we are going to just go in knowing that there's more than one species of tree and grass. Dr. Watson, please forgive me. Okay. <clears throat> All of the different tree chipmunks, right? Tricky gophers, technically. Okay, all the different insects and all that business that we pretend doesn't exist. Okay, everything that comes through here that we would add. So all of the different populations together form a community. Okay, that's fine and dandy, but we know that living things alone might just not be enough. So this depends on our question. How much do I want to include here? Okay, maybe the angry gray squirrels are stealing your food, okay, because there's a problem with where they're getting their food. So maybe we need to look at the environment, okay, the non-living portion. So if we're going to include things like the soil, or maybe the Kanawha River, right? Water is non-living. So we're going to expand this up to non-living things. Then we call that the ecosystem. And this would also perhaps include things like sunlight and rainfall or whatever else. Okay, anything non-living in this space that you're looking at. including the non-living. So this is living and non-living. So this is still our communities and we're adding on. So each time we go up a step, it's adding. We're getting bigger. Right? So our cells included the organelles and the molecules, right? So this is always additive. We're one step up. So our ecosystems included the communities. And now we're going to add the Kanawha River and the soil and the temperature to all of that. Is that more clear? Good. Good question. Okay. Now, if we were to go as big as possible with this, okay, our real question is, is how are all things interconnected? 
we could go global, okay, the biosphere. Okay, so like this summer, when people were looking at um, how the dust from the Sahara okay, was crossing the ocean and landing and fertilizing in Puerto Rico, okay, that was a global question. Okay, we're looking at intercontinental connectivity. Say that five times fast. Right? Okay. So that's a biosphere level question. We're looking at global connections between ecosystems that are anywhere near each other. Okay, and those are really hard to answer, right? We weren't sure what was going to happen. And that happens sometimes, right? We know dust from the Sahara sometimes gets down to Antarctica. And it does weird stuff. Right? Because Antarctica does not get a lot of nutrients, as you might imagine. Okay? So these are interesting questions on how you have this global connectivity. Any other questions about this? Okay, my best recommendation is to really focus on the. Woo! Don't play me. I know I have pictures in there. They're not for me. Hey, is to really focus on these. I find that the organism level up is where students kind of get them the most flip flop because it feels a little less intuitive. Oh, now you won't flip. And you should have a bunch of pictures. That's fine. Okay. So the next thing we want to talk about is in this class, what are the major themes or houses that we're going to look at? Okay. Um, these, uh, as you'll find, are not necessarily the order that we're going to go through. Remember, we're building from the ground up. So we're actually going to talk about cells, then genetics, then evolution. Um, but I'm really just going to talk about these smallest to largest as far as content goes. Okay. So let's talk about evolution first because we've actually already touched on that. And I said I want to tell you about my steampunk mods. So that's the first thing that we're going to talk about. I love my steampunk mods. Okay, so evolution. So we've all heard this bit before probably. In a way that always feels sort of very vague, gets regurgitated out of a textbook. Okay, and I think always just for some reason feels just like this side of intangible. Right? So the key behind evolution is its goal is to look at okay, how organisms are connected. So we're looking at how they're coming from this common ancestry. And the way we do this, classically originally, was from looking at fossils. Okay, and now we have modern text. So we can look at things like DNA and RNA. And we'll get to spend a little time in class looking at that, because we'll look at DNA and RNA. So we'll get to see how all cells start and stop exactly the same way. And it's really cool. And while it is really cool, this still sort of feels this side of, like, really hard to understand. Right? It doesn't feel intuitive. So when I look at evolution, right, I like to look at stuff that doesn't feel like we're staring at dinosaurs that did this thing over millions of years, and it feels like it's really intangible. Okay, so that's, I and mean, we're still going to talk about this, but what I really want to focus on today is something that's much more tangible and easier to understand. Something that occurred over a much quicker time period. And is, by the way, way cooler. Okay, so this is where my steampunk moths come in. Okay. So the key here is that while all of this is true, okay, in addition to this, evolution can occur over contemporary or single human lifetime time span. And so the one I'm going to talk about occurred at the beginning of the 1900s, which is the literal steampunk era that everybody fell in love with. Right? So we all kind of know the steampunk era, right? London in the 1900s. Okay, the air is filled with that sort of sexy soot. 
in the air, which of course comes from the fact that London had just switched over to coal and fire burning stoves, which puts out this sort of black protection. And this is a great point technically in history for people because it made heat accessible to the common person. So people like stop freezing to death, which is great. Um, but bad ultimately for people and environments because like you choke to death um, the soot in the air. So yeah, it was a give and take. But ultimately what ended up happening, aside from this being this really cool sort of edgy feeling time period, is there was all this soot in the air. Right, and so what this soot did is interact with the space around it. So around London are birch trees. Now, if you're not familiar with birch trees, these are trees that have white bark on them. Right. And so the population of moths around London has some diversity, white and dark. Right. Now, if you're a predator looking for your meal, just like you looking for a meal, you're lazy. I know I'm lazy. I DoorDash dinner last night. Okay, so we don't put a lot of effort into food. So if you have two moths sitting on a tree, okay, you're going to pick whatever moth is easiest to spot. So you have a white moth sitting on a white tree and you have a dark moth sitting on a dark tree. Which moth are you going to pick? Which moth is easier to see? Which moth sticks out more? White moth on white or dark moth on white? The dark one, right? Because you have high contrast. Right, so dark on white, like coloring black on a whiteboard, but white on white's gonna blend in. Okay, so our lazy bird oppressors are gonna go through and grab the first thing they see. So they're gonna grab all the dark moths. Okay, now this is the simple reality. All of evolution can be summed down to one thing. If you're alive, you can breed and have babies. That's it. When you have babies, they tend to look like you, right? Like that's just a simple reality. So living things have babies, dead things don't. That's it. That's all it comes down to. So the white moths that are still alive get to breed and have babies. They have more white babies. The dark moths are dead. Okay, so most of those moths that were alive at this time were white, matching in with the birch trees. Enter steampunk. Okay, so all the soot starts covering our pretty white birch trees, turning them dark. Okay, this switches the game up for our moths, right? So instead, when the birds come through, now you have white moths on dark trees and dark moths on dark trees. So now our dark moths are hidden and our white moths become easy pickings for the bird oppressors. Okay. Now all the rules of evolution stay the same. White moths die. They don't have babies because they did. Okay. Dark moths live, they get to have babies, babies that look like them. So more dark moths happen. A, A, do the thing. Thank you. So over time then, as more white moths are slowly picked off for dinner, there are more and more dark moths that survive, camouflaged, into our steampunk era of trees, having more dark moth babies. Okay. We have a larger proportion of dark moths after, in this case, five to ten years. So quite quickly. And so this is what we mean by adaptation or evolution. Right, all that's happened is because living things lived and had babies and dead things be dead, okay, we just saw adaptation or change from not camouflage to camouflage.
Okay, does this make sense? Follow along with my sexy steampunk mods. I love my steampunk mods. We good online? Man, excuse me. Okay, so let's look at cells then. Okay, so this is our next house. Okay. Cell theory, what do we need to be a cell? We already know this first one. That's why it's in red. You told me this. Okay, you told me this. Okay. You said that one of the things you need to be alive is a cell. Okay. So you already told me that a cell is the lowest level of organization that performs life. All right, so here is our two-footed grounding. This is what we know. It's a safe footing. We feel good about this. Okay, so the only thing that's really new on here then is the black text. Okay, which is, then what does it mean to be a cell? Right, that's what we really need to define here. And you actually told me some of this stuff already too, right? You told me that DNA is important. Okay, so remember we already talked about being alive, which we know cells are. You need to be able to reproduce. Biological immortality. Okay, so we need to be able to pass along that genetic information, that genetic component. DNA is the vessel by which that occurs. Okay, it's the box. You're going to put the genetic component in to pass it along. Okay, the other thing cells need to have is a membrane. Okay, I like to call it the grocery bag. Okay, cells come in lots of different shapes and sizes. Just like when you go grocery shopping, you're going to put lots of different things in the bag. We have lots of different organelles, lots of different content. None of that matters except the DNA, right? But what does matter is you need something to contain it, okay? The grocery bag, something to hold it all together and protect it while it moves around and does its thing, okay? And that's what the membrane is, okay? It's the grocery bag. It holds the whole thing together. So if we look at some examples, Come on, man. Thank you. Okay, so here I have two different types of cells. Here's a common single-celled organism, the prokaryote, and then something like us. Okay, you see that they look super different, right? They've got all sorts of different stuffings. Okay, but they have the same two features. Here's our membrane or our grocery bag on the outside holding all those stuffings together. Right? And here, it looks different, but it's still there, is that DNA, right? The genetic component, the vessel by which that you can transfer genetic information from one generation to the next. Okay, we will pick up here. Um, do you have a Socratic book? Sure, we're getting used to it. So make sure you go to Socrative.com. Okay, remember my room number is my name and then the hour that you have class. Okay, the last question on here should be the teacher's question. Okay, what you're going to do is tell me the name of the slide we finished on today. Okay, so I unboxed that for you. Okay, when you have finished, the back two rows here can leave out the back door. So it's always going to be my last name, 
and the hour that you're in class. Make sure when you put your name in that you're doing last name, comma, first name, right? That'll sort you. Okay, I won't see you guys again. Some of you I won't see till next Wednesday in face. Obviously, you'll be online, but make sure that you don't feel shy online. So if you have questions, type them in. Fallon will ask them for you. You can speak, right, or you can come get help. I didn't start the recording right away, so some of the stuff's missing at the beginning. She's Fallon, yeah.